Thank you, Doug, for coming. We had done with our casino, and again, come from some of our training that we have done. Such a great job in delivering such a positive message that we wanted to bring it to our larger community and our parents as well. We thought it was just important that we do this interview with this very capable man and father. So thank you, Doug, for coming. Thank you, Tom. It's, it's really wonderful to be here, and thank you for braving the weather. I, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, don't, I wouldn't have come out. So thank you. It's really nice to have you here. Um, um, so I guess I want to share first how much I appreciate being here, because I think that when a community is sharing and reflecting on the same information together, it makes it even more powerful. And so the, the district um, bringing me in to talk at the keynote and then to engage the parent community in this way is exciting for me, and it feels like this is what we need to be doing. And so, um, I think we survived this storm, right? That, that's my hope, is that, we're, that we've survived it. Um, and, and after the storm, I think there's a question about what comes next, right? And during COVID, I can remember throughout um, the hardest months, I remember thinking, I wish there was someone who I could, talk to that's been through something like this, but nobody I knew had ever been through anything like this. And then I remembered there was one person that I was very close to. It was my grandmother. Oh, well, she died about 30 years ago, but when I started reflecting on her life, I started thinking, I wish she was here to help me figure out how to get through this. She lived a life. So she was born in 1899, and when she was seven, there was a typhoid outbreak. And then when she was 15, World War I hit, right? And then there was a polio outbreak a couple years later. And then we all know about the Spanish flu and the impact that that's had on our country. And so all of that before she turned 20. But then what happened when she turned 20? The Roaring Twenties, right? This, this is a remarkable time in our country's history where things kind of opened up. And I love this picture. I thought it was a stock photo my brother sent this. This is actually my grandmother. Isn't that a great picture? And then, during that decade, she met and married my grandfather, Walt. And in 1929, they had my father. But we all know what happens after that, don't we? We're plunged in the Great Depression. And if that wasn't enough, World War II. And then, she suffered her own private tragedy, just as she had gotten through all of that. My grandfather died young, two years after the war. And here's the thing. I didn't remember or know any of this about my grandmother's life. But when my parents got divorced, it was my grandmother who showed us resilience. It was my grandmother who helped keep our family together. You can see she had a real way with kids, didn't she? She'd, be, she'd hate it that I show this picture, but I love this picture. Because she, she was with us through thick and thin. And I just wondered, what do we call this generation of people who lived through a pandemic, a depression, and two world wars? We call them the greatest generation, don't we? And so I wonder what we're going to call this generation. So when we think about where we're going to go, I think let's let history be our guide. Because there were pandemics before. The worst one was the Black Plague. The Black Plague took one out of every three European lives. Can you imagine a family of six on average would lose two people in that family? It devastated. And it lasted for a long, long time. And we also know about the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu dwarfs COVID. The Spanish flu took between 50 and 100 million lives worldwide. And in each of these moments in, in time, in history, the world turned upside down for these societies. But each time these cultures moved from pain to possibility, what came after the Black Plague? The Renaissance, this remarkable outgrowth of science and technology and this, this sharing of knowledge, cult dramatic cultural change. And we've already talked about the Roaring Twenties, this time where art and commerce all took off. When things fall apart, we rebuild and we reconnect. And this is the power of families. And this is the power of schools, because this is where it happens. Recovery is our superpower as a species. 
We've been through so much. We always find a way to make it through. But each time, as we make it through, we think differently. Because the world, after we shut it down, when we come out, the world looks different. And we begin to think differently. And this disruption has always led to innovation. So the question is, what will we change? I like what Winston Churchill said. He said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think that's our work. Because remember, kids were in pain prior to the pandemic. There was a childhood mental health crisis before the pandemic. Take a look at just some of the statistics. In the decade before COVID, rates of depression rose more than 60% in our kids. The number of children and teenagers who were seen in emergency rooms with suicidal thoughts or attempts doubled. us for this, this commercial break. That's how I don't, there we go. Thank you. Sure. See, we always make it through, right? And we learn a little something every time. I was thinking, yeah, this, I don't hear the echo anymore. All right. So here's the thing. The suicide rate for children is two times higher in the summer. I mean, in the, when school's in session, whereas for adults, it's higher in the summer. There's something about what we're doing in our schools and in our communities that's pushing kids to the edge of their ability to cope, and for some kids beyond that. Right before COVID, a study came out. Students in high-achieving schools are now named an at-risk group. Just attending a high-achieving school puts kids at risk. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation named the top environmental conditions harming adolescent wellness. We know the first ones. Poverty, trauma, discrimination. But then there's this excessive pressure to excel. And this is impacting kids all over. Now all kids at some level are impacted by, the, by stress. And then we tack COVID right on top of that. And so here's the thing, and this is my hope, and this is my belief, is that the pandemic can help us reverse this mental health epidemic. And that's my hope. So COVID began as a sprint. I'll tell you, everything changed. You remember Friday the 13th, March 13th, 2020. I can remember Pritzker saying, um, we're not gonna be a, you know, we're gonna shut it down until April 7th. And I wondered, how am I gonna make it till April 7th, right? And it was two years after that we were still going and we continued to work and we changed everything about our lives. And when our kids got through that first year, we thought, oh my gosh, whew, this was exhausting, but we made it. And then the second year, the same thing happened. And it's almost like someone tapped us on the shoulder partway through and said, hey, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And we train differently for marathons than we do for sprints. And I think that we are still, even though we don't have masks on, even though we're not socially distancing, we are still experiencing the impact of COVID. It's moved from an acute crisis to a chronic one. And again, we, we address acute crises differently than we do chronic crises. One of the things that happened and one of the things that's come out of this is a focus on social emotional learning. Social emotional learning has never been more important for our kids, has it? But it's never been more important for us either as educators and as parents. So I'm not sure if you've seen this, um, but this is a Castle is the uh, uh, does a, is an organization who does the, most of the research. Uh, the the uh, they are the forerunners in the research on social emotional learning, and this is their this is their social emotional learning competency wheel. And what they say is social emotional learning is made up of these things: self awareness, being aware of what's happening in our bodies, self management, knowing then how to manage that. Social awareness, what's happening for other people? And then having the skills to be able to navigate those. And then finally, 
We can hit responsible decision making when we've got all those things in place, right? We think better in those moments. So when theories dovetail, it tells me that we're onto something. And the, the leader in the research and practice of resilience and trauma in kids, his name is Bruce Perry. And he talks about we need to be emotionally regulated, we need to be connected in relationship in order to find our best brains, in order to, be, to access reason. So take a look at how these dovetail. We need to be regulated. Regulation is all about self-awareness and self-management. Relationship, being related, is all about being aware of what's happening for other people and having those skills and then reason and responsible decision making are synonymous. The thing about COVID is it's been an SEL classroom for all of us. We have all learned more about our social emotional worlds than we ever did before. I learned more in the last two years than I think I did in the previous 20 about my own management of my own emotions. And if we take Castle's model a little bit further, what they say is we need to strengthen adult SEL before we even get to students. And as parents, the same thing is true. We need to be aware of our own social emotional world before we can be able to support our kids. We can't help our kids if we aren't aware of what's happening for ourselves. Our regulation needs to come first. And one of the interesting things for me, when I was doing some work with Mary Jo Barrett, she's a, a social worker and a trauma expert, and we went to um, work with the teachers in Highland Park before the students came, and I learned this from her. And it's so simple, and yet I thought, how did I not think of this before? She says, our world is constantly expanding and contracting. We wake up and we, we engage our whole day and then we sleep. We expand, we, do, we work a whole day, and then we sleep and we contract. A football team um, goes out and plays a half, and then they come for halftime, they reflect, they rest, and then they go out and play again. Our, our breath, we're, we're expanding and contracting. And here's the thing, that we need to contract in order to expand. I could say, I'm going to have a really productive week this week. I'm not going to sleep. I'm just going to expand. And that would not work well for me, would it? That's because we need to contract in order to have the energy and the focus to expand. And the more there's a rhythm to this, the better. But here's the thing that's hard, I think, for our kids, is children's lives have been expanding more and more, but we haven't been contracting. We've been, it's come at the cost of contracting, and the same thing with our lives as parents. We continue, our kids continue to get involved in so many things, we get involved in so many things, so many, um, so many ways at work and in our personal lives, we continue to add things without taking them away. And this has a cost, and we need to be aware of that cost. So I want to talk about four lessons that I'd like for us to think about as we move away and move on from COVID. And the first lesson is, we don't need to be perfect. We just need to show up. So COVID stress has been a horrible thing. It has been, it's the first time we've ever experienced anything like this, so it's new. And new stresses are always hard. There's a constant, there was a constant threat of exchanging the virus, and still now there's still that threat and wonder, What's going to happen? There's an intensity. So many people died. So many people lost their jobs. And there are very few stresses that hit everybody on the planet. And COVID's one. Everybody was impacted. It's been an extraordinary time with extraordinary stress. But I also think there's real opportunity. So what happens when we get stressed is we get pushed into the lower parts of our brain, right? And when we get there, we lose some of the tools that we need the most to be able to cope with our lives. We're not as good at listening. We're not as creative or flexible. We lose empathy in these moments. Our memory is shoddy. Anybody notice during COVID how hard it was to remember simple things? What, what happens, and that's why, that's why eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. Under stress, our memory lets us down. Language, have you ever been so upset that you can't find the words? Or if you're like me, the only words you can find are four letters long, right? And I tend to try and yell them because for some reason that helps, right? 
And then inhibition, it's hard for us to be able to stop doing something. We're more impulsive. My, uh, I'm, I've been married 30 years, and I've had a couple arguments with my wife, and never once, never once in the middle of when I'm melting down did I say, honey, listen, I'll listen to you. I've been doing all the talking, right? That doesn't happen. I don't say, hey, well, let's do it your way. We did it my way last time. I want to be that guy, right? Hey, honey, I'll bet my tone of voice is really annoying you, right? No, I don't think, I, I wish I could say that. I wish I was that guy in that moment, but I'm not that guy. Hopefully, when I've calmed down, I can get back to this, right? But in the moment, if you took a scan of my brain, it would, feel so, it would look something like this. Don't we just seem stupider? We seem dumber in these moments. And that makes it hard. And as a result, during COVID, during the hardest times of COVID, we weren't the same people, were we? It was harder for us to show up as colleagues, as parents, as friends, as spouses. And I don't know about you, but my energy was different. I'm usually high energy, but it was harder for me to find the energy. I'm an optimistic person. But after months and months of continuing to have that, that um, um, the timeline pushed forward, I started becoming discouraged, less motivated, harder for me to focus. And so during this time, and we're still coming out of this in a lot of ways, students were limited. Their brains were in lower brain. They didn't have everything that they needed to bring into school to learn. Teachers, everybody was learning a new platform as well as dealing with their own stress. Nobody's brain was, uh, was, in the, um, was at their best. And the same thing for us as parents. So what did they learn during this time? This is one of the biggest fears we have, is that kids haven't learned. But I think, I know that there's uh, challenges in, what the, in having them hit their, all of their learning targets for many kids. But we've been teaching something, I think, much more important in the long run. And that is we've been teaching resilience. So D.W. Winnicott, he was a, uh, a psychoanalyst and a pediatrician, um, brilliant guy in the 1940s. And he had this theory called the good enough mother. At the time, there was, all the theories of parenting said, you need to do everything just right. You need to follow all of these strict rules, otherwise your kid is going to end up being a failure. And Winnicott said, no, that's not true. We just need to be good enough. And good enough mother, good enough father, good enough coach, good enough teacher, right? And I love this next line of his. He says, babies and children actually benefit when their mothers fail them in manageable ways. Not abusive ways, but manageable ways. If I forget to pick my son up at baseball practice and he learns that the world is sometimes unpredictable and he finds his way home, he's learned a small lesson about resilience. The more of those lessons he's able to, to learn, the more resilient he becomes. And those, there were so many of those lessons during COVID. And so can we be good enough as parents? This is one of the lessons. We just need to be good enough. Who was a perfect parent during COVID? Anybody? No, we messed up all the time. We were faced with all sorts of new challenges. But here's the thing. I think our generation of par as parents is more critical of ourselves than anybody else. When we see our child in distress, we feel like we need to fix it. There's something we've done that we need to fix. And yet, this is what Brene Brown says. We don't need to be perfect. Sometimes the bravest and most important thing you can do is just show up. And that's what we did for our kids. There are two authors who are um, leaders in child development, um, Dan Siegel and Tina Bryson. And they wrote this book called The Power of Showing Up. And I like this line, the, the subtitle is how parental presence shapes who our kids become and how their brains get wired. And so what they talk about is showing up has four different qualities. The first is feeling safe, and that's protecting them from harm. And during COVID, we did everything we could to protect them from harm, right? But there's something else. There's psychological safety, this sense that I'm emotionally safe here in my family. I'm emotionally safe here in school. And so part of safety is helping them feel safe and also avoiding becoming the source of their fear. Here's the mistake we make, and I'm not sure if this happened to any of you. I've got older kids, but I lost my temper with my kids more during COVID, I think, than I had other times. And I want to say it's OK. We don't need to be perfect. But here's the thing, when we do, 
can we first forgive ourselves? And then can we make it right with our kids? And here's the thing, when we make it right, what do they learn? They learn how to make it right when they make a mistake, when they lose their cool, because they are learning from us in these moments. The second is can we help kids feel seen? And this feeling seen is about being attuned, really being attuned to what's happening in their lives. What are they feeling? What are they experiencing? And this is one of the most fundamental ways that we show that we help kids learn their emotional world. We are hardwired to, be, to mimic infants' faces. Have you ever noticed, have you ever held an infant and not been able to mimic what they're doing? It's hardwired. It's almost impossible. I held one just a few months ago. And I'm like, I, I'm going to not do it. And I just was almost impossible, right? But here's the thing that happens, is they, have a, they feel something, and they have an expression. They don't know what it is. And then we mimic that expression. And then they see, oh, that's what that feeling is. That's what that looks like in other people. This is how we become attuned to one another. And it happens all the time, doesn't it? All the time. You know, he takes it a little too far, right? <laughs> but as kids get older, what does it look like? This presence is about listening, right? Being curious about what their experience is. Letting them know that their feelings are real and that they're going to be fleeting. All of our feelings are always fleeting and helping our kids realize that we just need to ride the waves of our feelings. But the mistake we make is when our kids are in distress, we either try and fix it because it's too hard for us to sit with it. We may minimize it. You don't have to worry about that. Why would you worry about something silly like that? Right? Or we shame them. You're acting like your two-year-old brother. Right? These are some of the things that come out of our mouths. And those aren't helpful to build resilience. So what do we do? Instead, we soothe. I like this idea of holding space. We just need to hold space with our child until, as they ride the waves of their emotions. We just need to be present with them. I like this quote, when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our, to share our calm, not join their chaos. It's very hard not to because this dysregulation is highly contagious. And yet, it's so important that when our child is dysregulated, the more regulated we can be, the more they can learn how to regulate. And then, hopefully, they learn how to regulate themselves. With younger kids, it may be teddy bears or Legos. With older kids, it may be talking to friends or listening to music or walking the dog. But the mistake we make is we often punish instead of soothe when they're dysregulated, when they're struggling. This picture is poignant for me, right? This, uh, there, this, there's so much shame in that boy's posture. He's facing the wall. His head is bowed. And yet there's this regulation strategy, right? Right there under his left arm. You know, Charlie is dog. And I wish if I was his parent, instead of saying, go take a time out. You're treating your sister so badly. Take a time out. Ten minutes, whatever it may be. I wish I had said, you're upset. Your sister's upset. I'm upset. Why don't you and Charlie go downstairs, take a few minutes, I'll calm down, and then let's figure it out when we're all calm again. But we get impatient, don't we? It's like it's hard in those moments. We want to fix it right now. And yet if we just give it a little bit of time, it's amazing how our brains come back online again. And if we give it even more time to know that these are all developmental skills. This idea of self-soothing is developmental. We get better at it as we get older. Some kids are better at it at younger ages. Other kids are better at it at older ages. But it always gets better. We're better at it at 17 than we are at 7. At 27 than we are at 17. And then if we can do those things, then we've got a secure base in which we can go out and explore the world. This was in a middle school bathroom. I loved it. It says, you have within you right now everything you need to deal with whatever the world can throw at you. This is what we want our kids to be able to feel when they walk out into the world, when they walk into middle school, when they walk into elementary school, when they go off to, to college or their jobs, right? But it's important that we 
believe and understand that good enough is good enough for them and for us. And let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, that there's beauty in imperfection. Our kids have been watching us during COVID. They watched how you were resilient, how you changed everything about your lives, how their teachers changed everything about how they taught. I like this quote from James Baldwin, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. They've been watching and learning from your resilience. Note to self, all you have to do is show up, be late, be scared, be a mess, be weird, be confused. Just be there. You'll figure out the rest as you go. This is my story of COVID, right? It w I was all those things. And we figured it out, and it wasn't pretty. But we figured it out. All right, lesson two. We are more adaptable than we imagined. So Tom Boyce has done a lot of this research, and he did a lot of this research in, in Wisconsin. And what he did was he followed kids from um, in preschool all the way up post high school. And he would um, watch them in their homes, follow them and watch them in their classrooms. He took saliva samples to measure how much stress they were experiencing. And what he said after all of this, decades of research, he said, really, there are two kinds of kids. They're dandelion kids and they're orchid kids. He said, dandelion kids, they can grow up just about anywhere, right? They can, they can take just about whatever the world throws at them, and they're going to be OK. He said, orchid kids, they need, they're much more sensitive to their environment. They need the right light. They need the right water, right? A hurricane can come through, and, and my lawnmower can come through, and that dandelion's going to still be there, right? But the orchid kids are more sensitive to their environment. And if we can get it right, they often end up more beautiful than the dandelion. But here's what he found. 80% of kids are dandelion kids. 80% of kids do OK. And this research, this 80% shows up in a lot of different places. Kids in war-torn area, torn areas, about 80% of kids do OK. Natural disasters, about 80% of kids do OK. Resilience is the norm and not the exception. And we've seen that for a lot of our kids. But that means that 20% of our kids are orchid kids. 20% of our kids are going to be more sensitive to their environment. And with these kids, they often feel excluded from environments. They often feel shame in not being able to handle things the way other people handle them. And then we make assumptions. You don't want to go to school because you're lazy, or you're too fragile, or you're too this, or you're too that, or this is. And, and here's the thing. This is our skill. Can we ask and not assume? I had a. Uh, a friend of mine who um, taught high school um, English. And during COVID, it was, um, you know, do no harm. So kids didn't need, these were, grad, these were high school seniors. They didn't need to go to class to get their degree. All the kids but one showed up for his class for that whole semester. And the one that didn't, he's like, I knew that kid would just mail it in. That kid was always looking for excuses to get out of stuff. And he finally got it. About a month in, he got an email from this student. And the student said, can we talk? Can we set up a Zoom meeting? And he said, sure, I'd love to. And the student said, um, I'm sorry that I haven't been in class. My parents have been fighting. They lost their jobs. I think they're going to get a divorce. A week ago, my best friend took his own life. I can't even imagine putting on my screen and being able to focus on anything. Wow, did he wish that he had asked and didn't assume. When kids struggle with the expectations we have for them, can we be curious? That's our work, to wonder why is this hard for them. They may not have the words for it, but to think that what's, what's making this hard for them and how can we support them? So the bad news during COVID especially is that COVID was an accelerant. COVID took strong families and made them stronger and took families that were struggling and made them struggle more. This is what happened in so many different ways. Interesting statistic, the divorce rate during COVID went way up, as did marital satisfaction. Isn't that interesting, right? What happened was many people 
in strong families spent more time together. But vulnerable children and families were at much greater risk during COVID. And this is true COVID and um, post-COVID. A major driver of child well-being during COVID is how parents are functioning. How we are doing has a huge impact on how our students are doing. Perceived parental criticism and unreachable standards predicts child depression. I'm not saying that you're aware of the criticism you're giving your kids. I'm not even saying you're criticizing your kids, but they perceive it. There's some interesting research. Parent, they ask parents, what do you value more? Uh, what, do you what do you communicate to your kids you value more, achievement or kindness? 90% of parents reported that their top, uh, top priority for their child is that they're caring. Then they went and asked the kids. 81% of children report that their, child, their parents value achievement over happiness and caring. Achievement and happiness over caring. What happens is when our child is caring, we say, that's really nice. You're so good to your brother and sister. You're so good to your classmate. And then that's it. But what happens when they come home with a C minus? Then we have a long conversation. Then we make a plan about what we're going to do about that grade. And then all of our energy goes into that. And so our kids are not getting the same messages that we believe we're sending often. So we've got these kids who've been through all of this stress. How do we make sense of this? Well, one of the ways that I like to think about this is through the lens of post-traumatic growth. How many of you have heard of post-traumatic growth? A couple of psychologists in the room, maybe, right? But here's the thing. We talk a lot about post-traumatic stress, and we don't know much about post-traumatic growth. People who experience adversity often see positive growth afterwards and arise to an even higher level of functioning. What happens is a traumatic event, it turns out, is not simply a hardship to be overcome. Instead, it's transformative. It becomes a dividing line in people's lives. There's a before and an after COVID for all of us. So what does the research say about people who have been able to turn a traumatic event into post-traumatic growth event? Increased inner strength and openness to new possibilities in life, closer and often deeper relationships with friends and family, an enhanced appreciation for life, and a stronger sense of spirituality. My siblings and I, we all live across the country. We would talk maybe a couple times a year. We've been on Zoom calls still. We still have our Zoom call. We're closer than we've ever been, right? And here's the kicker. We talk a lot more about post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic growth is actually more common than post-traumatic stress. We learn resilience. And we learn by watching. We learn by experiencing. When people are asked how they're coping with the biggest stresses in their lives, 82% say they're coping, they're drawing on strength developed from past experiences. I know we're not through COVID yet. I know there's a tale on the impact of COVID, but I believe that 10 years from now, kids, are, your kids, my kids, are going to be able to manage stresses in their lives in a very different way had there not been COVID, much like my grandmother was able to, to um, be resilient in ways that I would never have imagined she could have. They're going to look back and they're going to say, we made it through the hardest time. I believe that this has been the hardest time in US educational history, to be honest with you, the hardest two years. And they made it. And I think they're, they're going to be able to rely on that when their marriages struggle, when they have health concerns, and they've got tr troubles in their jobs. This is how it happens. You can think of resilience as a set of skills that can be learned. Part of the skill building comes from exposure to very difficult but manageable experiences. Do you notice the language again? Manageable. The same thing Winnicott said. What happened is you guys worked so hard to make this a manageable stress for most kids. And because we were able to make this manageable, teachers worked hard to make this manageable for kids. Because of that, then we can experience post-traumatic growth. So here's the thing. There's something called toxic optimism. I'm not saying, thank goodness we had COVID, right? That's not my message. We're so blessed to have had this experience to be more resilient. No, that's not it. But I do think the tragic optimism resonates with me. It's the ability to maintain hope and find meaning in life despite 
It's inescapable pain and loss and suffering. It's our ability, it requires us to hold both truths. That it was, it's been painful and hard, the hardest time in many of our lives, and it can be the source of strength for us and for our kids. Both can be true. Lesson number three. We focused on family. Family connection is remarkably important and makes all the difference. So I like this. This is the, the well-being pyramid, right? This is a, a way of thinking about how do we have good well-being? Well, the first is let's make sure that I'm doing good self-care. I'm sleeping well. I'm, I'm getting, uh, um, I'm getting good, good, um, I'm getting, eating nutritionally, right? Then there's the group. Who are the people I'm around? That support that we get from a group can help our wellness. And then there's the system that we don't have a lot of control over, right? It's, this, it's what the state decides. It's what the school board decides. It's what, um, um, what my job, my, the bosses at my work decide. But this, you know, in so many ways, there's only so much self-care we could do during COVID, right? Only so many do downward dogs we can do, right? There's, there's only, there's a limit to our ability to take care of ourselves, the group, and we can't control the system, but the group we're in makes a huge difference. Let's take a look at different ways of thinking about stress. There are three different kinds of stress. Positive stress, tolerable stress, and toxic stress. Positive stress is when you just get this brief increase in your stress response system. Like me tonight, I'm a little bit anxious, right? It, and hopefully when I go home, that stress will go away, right? But it goes up and comes back down. Tolerable stress is a much more powerful kind of stress. It's, it's like when you lose someone you love. It could be um, a major injury or illness. Um, it could be um, the stress of, of um, becoming unemployed. These things that are, that are temporary but very, very painful in the moment. And then there's toxic stress, which is this ongoing trauma that we may be experiencing. But take a look in these definitions. For tolerable and toxic stress, they talk about the power of positive relationships and how they buffer the stress. That these relationships, when we can be in a community of other people, this creates a connective tissue for resilience. We all become stronger in communities that are connected. Take a look at some of the belonging research. I love this. They took a look at 12,000 teenagers and found that the most powerful protective factor for every form of adolescent behavior Emotional distress, drug abuse, violence, and suicidality is their sense of belonging at school and at home. This is so wonderful for me when we've got educators and parents in the same room, learning the same things. This is how we help kids be resilient, is by embedding them in communities at home and school. Students with a strong sense of belonging are more motivated to learn, perform better academically, have better attendance, engage in less misconduct, they're healthier, have higher self-esteem, and better mental health. What is there to argue with about that? How can we make sure that this is our focus as we think about what, what our kids need? The belonging comes before achievement. So how do we create those communities? Well, Google has some ideas. Google has ideas about everything, don't they? But Google does a ton of research. And what they did was they created this thing called Project Aristotle, which was they wanted to see how, the, how their teams could be effective. And I think there are some lessons for us and our families. What they found is that teams, great teams, have two qualities. The first is equal airtime. Everybody's voice matters. Everybody feels comfortable sharing their opinion, even if mom and dad disagree with it. Boy, did I have a hard time with that with my teenage son. It's gotten better, but it's not always pretty because I didn't want to hear his opinion very often about how late he thought he should be able to drive, right? Things like that. And the other is attunement. We talked about this. The great teams all were attuned to what was happening for one another. And remember, this is from um, one of the lessons from the first part, is how can we be attuned to one another? And when we have a places where our voice matters and we see one another and we're seen by one another, we get this thing called psychological safety. Amy Edmondson has done a lot of research on this and coined the term. And what she says is psychological safety means it's safe to take a risk here. 
And if I take a risk here, people aren't going to mock me. Right? Or dad's not going to get so angry with me that I want to be out until 4 in the morning with the car. Right? And that I can be myself. But this is the work. I think the same thing is true in our families. Everybody has a voice. And we attend to one another. So I want to put a plug in for family dinners. It's interesting. We didn't do any family dinners until COVID. And then we did four months of every night we had family dinners. It was a game changer for us. And my kids were older, right? They were both in college. And I thought, oh my gosh, how did we miss this, right? But the research on this is really, really powerful. Families that have dinner together, students, uh, the, the kids have higher vocabulary and achievement. They, their reading scores are higher. Their empathy and social skills are better. Why? Because they're at the table and we're learning. They're learning from us. When there's conflict, they learn from us about how to manage that. They learn about how to assert themselves. There's constant coaching that we do at the dinner table. And there's lower incidence of suicide, substance abuse, depression, aggression, and teenage sexual behavior. Not a bad combination, right? And I want to put in a plug for grace. Now, I'm not saying, that, not from a religious perspective, but there's something interesting about what grace does. It does a lot of things that positive psychology says are important for us. The first thing is it often involves gratitude. What we're grateful for. Gratitude is powerful in supporting the mental health of kids. There's touch. We often hold hands. When we touch one another, there's this cascading of positive neurotransmitters that make us feel better. And then there's this time generally for quiet reflection. Mindfulness is also really powerful. It doesn't have to take long. But when I talk about family dinners, I'm not talking about the broccoli. Right? It's good if you, they can be nutritious. The most important thing is we're coming together as families, that we're connecting as families, and they're learning from us. And just know that our children are watching. They're watching to see how we as adults manage conflict. They're watching to see who chips in and who doesn't. They're watching to see um, how, um, how we engage with one another. They're watching to see our manners. Right? All of these things. All right. This is actually lesson four. We learned about the pressure we're putting on our kids. You know, something interesting happened in that spring of 2020 when everything shut down, when, um, when there were no sports teams, when there were no, um, um, when people were um, getting, when there was no uh, um, um, grading had changed, right? All of these things began to change. Sunaya Luthar does research on what happens, what happened for kids. And what she found is the well-being of these students, the, especially the high-achieving students, actually improved. As classes and exams were canceled, grading moved to pass fail, and extracurricular activities ceased, they reported lower levels of stress, anxiety, and, and depression as compared to the year before. I'm not saying that there weren't some kids who were really struggling, because there were. But overall, taking all these things away didn't mean that kids were happy, right? But they were less anxious, and they were less depressed. Homework. I, uh, in my private practice, kids would say, man, I hate this uh, remote learning, but I love the fact that I don't have homework. And guess who else was saying that? The parents. We're saying, I'm so glad that we don't have this fight every night, that when we sit down, when, when I come home, the first question is, what homework do you have? Now the question is, what do you want to do tonight? It's different, and it showed up differently for kids. Kids slept more during COVID. Sleep is important for our mental health. My daughter was doing a statistics class, and, and the, every year they run the same analysis. They, they do a survey of how much kids sleep every night. And in, uh, at her high school. And so um, they had decade, a decade worth of data. And what they found is that before COVID, kids were getting seven hours of sleep on average. During COVID, they were getting almost an hour more. Is that a big deal? It is if we think about 
ADHD, obesity, behavior problems, academics, and social skills. All of these things improve with more sleep. And the interesting thing is we look at this mental health epidemic. Kids in 1980 were getting an hour more sleep than they were in 2010. And my guess is that that's even going down. That this is why we, I believe this is one of the contributing factors to why our kids are struggling in these ways, in ways they never have before. Take a look. A CP6 grader will perform in class like a fourth grader. A loss of one hour of sleep is equivalent to the loss of two years of cognitive maturation and development. We're just dumber when we're tired. We make worse decisions. It's harder for us to focus. It's harder for us to complete work for all of us. And schedules quieted down, didn't they? Kids weren't having to rush to their three, to their th three different teams. High school kids, you know, this, this idea that I've got I've to um, be in the play, and I've got to do the service project, and I've got to be, in, I've gotta be on varsity sports, and I've got to be in four AP classes, right? And guess who else got a break? Adults were more regulated. Adults were calmer. You didn't have to figure out, oh, shoot, where did we leave this? Uh, do they need their shin pads or do they need their helmet? What, uh, did, did we get lunch for him or did we get the snack? Oh, shoot, I'm supposed to, to chop the oranges for the soccer game. Right? We didn't have to worry about all of these things in the same way. So the kids started getting better from a mental health perspective. And then we blew it, didn't we? Because when we came back, everybody was worried about what they missed, all the learning standards they missed. Look at what Luther says. These improvements were short-lived. Beginning in the fall of 2020, as schoolwork ramped back up, the mental health of adolescents returned to pre-pandemic levels or worse. They had the same pressure, but for many of them, we added the pressure to catch up, which made it even harder. What we know is our lives should be consistent with our biology. We need more movement. Sitting for six hours is really hard for kids. We went outdoors. We had tents outdoors. That's good for kids. We need kids to to be more, we need more collaborative learning instead of solo learning. When we're connected, we learn more. It opens our brains up to be curious instead of focusing on achievement. Can we focus on our curiosity? Can we contract? Can we have time to breathe? I wondered as I read that research, what would happen for me if I went to my wife at the beginning of the school year, and I said, hey, listen, honey, I've got a new schedule. I'm going um, um, to play basketball to get in shape every morning. So I'm going to wake up at 5, hit the gym at 5.30 to 7. I'm going to work a full day. Probably going to work right through lunch, because I want to be in the garage band, and we're going to have some gigs every weekend. So I'm going to be practicing with my, with my buddies from 4 to 6.30 every day. I'll get home about 7. I'll just warm up whatever food you have. I'll, I'll take it into the den. And then I'm going to do my email that I missed to get caught up. What do you think she'd say to me? I think she'd say, there'll be some papers waiting for you on your desk in the den, right? Because she'd say, that wasn't, that's not healthy for you. This isn't right for us as a family. And yet, this is what we see as being the ideal successful kid in high school. What we want to do is be careful that we don't continue to put more and more pressure on our kids. Let's not try to do more to make up for lost learning. Kids' brains are plastic. When we put stress on them, they develop slower. When we connect them in regulated, connected communities, it opens their brains up for learning. This is what we've been getting wrong. Our kids are going to struggle with some of these skills. Absolutely. They missed out on a lot of experiences for, for a couple years. Younger kids, older kids, right? So let's, what does the, the preeminent adolescent psychologist say about, about this developmental problem? He says, do kids need certain kinds of experiences at this point in their lives in order to develop normally? Yes, but there's no reason to think an interruption like this is going to cause permanent damage. The plasticity afforded by the childhood brain at this age allows for recovery. As long as we don't overstress that brain and we let it grow, was it a lost two years? Or were they years of discovery and transformation? That's what I wonder. I hope it's discovery and transformation. COVID shined a light on our community. It shined a light on our children. 
I like this, uh, this address by David Foster Wallace to Kenyon College in 2005. He said, there are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? And then the two young fish swim on for a bit, and eventually one of them looks at the other and goes, what the heck's water? The immediate point of the fish story is the most obvious and important realities are often the ones that are hardest to talk about. I think it's hard for us to talk about the pressure we're putting on our kids. We're all up swimming in that water. We all are. But we got out of that water for a while. And there was research that tells us that our kids started getting healthier. Now that we know, what will we do? So this flip side of COVID, you know, opportunity often comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. And I can't think of a time, two years, when I, didn't ex when I experienced more misfortune or felt more defeated than during COVID. The world turned upside down for all of us. But one of the things that happened is we couldn't protect our kids from the stress they were experiencing. A lot of times we can protect them from things, but we couldn't protect them from this sea change of culture, that we, this cultural change we needed to make in order to meet the demands. We couldn't helicopter parent these kids out of this stress. We couldn't snowplow parent this stress away. They had to sit with this. And so when we rebuild, we need to be intentional. And as we go back, we need to be thoughtful. I think we're going to have a generation of kids that's more independent, more resilient, and more community focused than generations before. Why? Because for two years, they needed to be more independent. They needed to try things more on their own than they ever had before. They needed to be more resilient. And they needed, we, in order to get through this, we had to do things as a community that we never had to do before. So 10 years from now, when kids look back, what will they remember? I don't think they're going to look back and they're going to say, yeah, I, I, I learned fractions in, a remote, in remote um, learning in fourth grade, so I never made it to Purdue's engineering school. I don't think they're going to say that. You know what they're going to say? The world flipped us all upside down. And I watched my teachers and I watched my parents adapt to this. And now I know how to adapt. And so when things come my way, I know that I can do this. When we pull back, when the curtain is fully back on COVID, my hope is we realize what we've learned and we've discovered some things about ourselves, about our kids, about our society. You know, COVID came in in the March of 2020 and we were writing a story for our kids and our lives. And COVID came and took the pen and paper right out of our hands, didn't it? But we get to write the next chapter. For my grandmother, that chapter was the greatest generation. And I'm excited to see what we write for our kids. All right. That's all I got. But I'd be glad to take some questions and comments um, if you have any. I'm so glad. And I'll be up here if you want to ask a question privately or have a thought privately. I'll, I'll stay up here and I'll even take my mic off like I did before, all right? I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for braving this weather, and I hope you get home safely. But thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it.